like to welcome you to this uh, broadcast or tape. This is part four in our series entitled Behind the Door. A look at events that have transpired in history and who was behind those events. In this tape we're going to look at what some people, many people have called the greatest terrorist act in U.S. history. Before we get into this tape, behind the door number four, let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you that you are on your throne and that you are calling the shots in this world. You allow certain things to happen to wake people up, to alert people as to where they are in their lives and where we are as a nation. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be our guide and our teacher, to instruct us in what is true and right, and help us to stand there. In Jesus' name, amen. April 19th, 1995, 9.02 a.m., an explosion nearly demolished the Alfred E. Murray Building, federal building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. 168 American citizens died as a result of that explosion, including a number of little children attending the daycare center housed in the building. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Alfred Murrah building was bombed. The United States government has declared that it was a fertilizer bomb inside a Ryder truck parked in front of the building that did the damage. The government steadfastly maintained that it was a single bomb that did this terrible damage to the building. Is there anything to dispute that conclusion? And on what basis was that conclusion arrived at? A retired brigadier general by the name of Benton K. Parton, a 31-year veteran of the United States Air Force and one of the premier experts on the subject of explosives, I have a document done by General Benton Parton in which he analyzes the bombing of the Murrah building. General Parton served as commander of the Air Force Armament Technology Lab. He was the first chairman of the Office of the Secretary of Defense Joint Service Air Munitions Requirements and Development Committee and was responsible for munitions development for the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. He is a recognized expert as a major guiding force of our modern precision guided weapon systems. In General Parton's report, it's about a six-page document which I will happily photocopy for anybody who hears this tape and you can study it for yourself. In General Parton's report, he states emphatically that the Murrah building was brought down by a number of bombs placed at certain support columns inside the building and that the fertilizer bomb theory is absolute nonsense. Now some people that have seen General Parton's report one, a Taylor Jesse Clear, a former special advisor for combating terrorism at the Pentagon's Counterterrorism Directorate, 
stated that General Parton's report is the most convincing and sensible analysis of the event I've ever seen. Sam Groening, a former military demolitionist and a professional blaster for the past 30 years, stated that Parton's report was absolutely right and that no truck bomb full of ANFO could cause the type of damage done to the Murrah building. Another man by the name of Sam Cohen, renowned physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project, said that the fertilizer truck bomb is a fairy tale. Many, many experts in the field of physics or demolition or explosives have come forward and said it was impossible for the fertilizer bomb to have blown up the Murrah building. The Department of Justice put out a 450 page plus report on the bombing of the Murrah building and in that document one agent Williams concluded that the main explosive used at Oklahoma City was ANFO. Williams acknowledged that he reached this conclusion because Terry Nichols, one of the defendants in the case, purchased ammonium nitrate and diesel oil prior to the bombing. Without the evidence of these purchases, Agent Williams admitted he would have been unable to conclude that ANFO was used. Williams stated that based on the post-blast scene alone, it could have been dynamite or it could have been other things. So Agent Williams in his report in the Department of Justice report on the bombing at Oklahoma City states the only reason he believed it, that it was ammonium nitrate and diesel fuel was because Terry Nichols had purchased some of that. But there was absolutely no evidence of that ANFO, or ammonium nitrate, a fertilizer bomb, no evidence of that at the Murrah building. Now let me read to you a, just a little bit from Benton Parton's six-page document. He states this, It is impossible that the destruction to the building could have resulted from such a bomb alone. To cause the damage pattern that occurred to the Murrah building, there would have to have been demolition charges at several supporting column bases, at locations not accessible from the street, to supplement the truck bomb damage. Indeed, a careful examination of photographs showing the collapsed column bases reveals a failure mode produced by demolition charges and not by a blast from the truck bomb. Now that's what Benton K. Parton, a retired general, stated. His conclusion, he said this, the Murrah building was not destroyed by one sole truck bomb. The major factor appears to have been detonation of explosives carefully placed at four critical junctures on supporting columns within the building. The only possible reinforced concrete structural failure, failure solely attributable to the truck bomb was the stripping out of the ceilings of the first and second floors in the pit area behind columns B4 and BY. That 
was the report of General Benton K. Parton, Brigadier General of the United States Air Force, 31 years of active duty in the military of the United States. Benjamin Benton K. Parton has just stated that there were bombs placed on the structural columns inside the Murrah building. So Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, they had a bomb. It was in a Ryder truck, but it they were simply the patsies. They were simply the decoys for somebody else's work. Somebody else who had access to the Murrah building. Somebody who had access to the building plan so that they knew where the reinforced structural columns were, where they had to bomb. Somebody who knew that information. Something else that's alarming in the Oklahoma City bombing. There was a seismograph at the local university that recorded two separate pressure waves approximately 10 seconds apart of equal intensity, indicating there were two separate explosions. Then there was the live feed video interview of a man identifying himself as, as an assistant fire chief on the scene who stated that the bomb squad, who, as many reports have indicated, were at the Murrah building at 7 o'clock that morning, two hours before the bombing took place. Now what were they doing there two hours before the bombing took place? But the bomb squad diffused one unexploded bomb inside the building and were working on a second device. That indicates that there were bombs that were strategically placed in the building that didn't go off. The Department of Defense, the Pentagon report of the Murrah building bombing stated, and this was done by two explosive experts, they concluded that five high explosive bombs were placed at strategic locations on the columns inside the building. There were live feeds that came across the television right after the bombing. There were statements made by Mayor Ron Nordick, Dr. Randall Heather, Governor Frank Keating, and numerous anchors all stating that the FBI and the ATF have confirmed that high explosive bombs were taken out of the building. Was the governor, the mayor, and the news anchors lying to us? Friends, there were bombs that were placed strategically at the structural columns of the Murrah building. Timothy McVeigh was simply a scapegoat. Now it's been stated by many and it's been confirmed that on the day the Murrah building was bombed none of the ATF agents came to work that morning and the ATF agents who had children in the daycare center did not drop their children off that day. There were no ATF agents or their children on the casualty list 
at the Oklahoma City bombing. One woman who lost two children, two little boys in the blast. She was talking with U.S. Attorney Pat Ryan. And this young woman by the name of Edie Wilburn asked where the ATF agents were on April 19th. And Attorney Ryan brushed her off with a glib comment that they were playing in a golf tournament at Shawnee, Oklahoma. But Attorney Pat Ryan was mistaken. Some of the DEA were playing golf, but not the ATF. In a report that came out on a shortwave radio broadcast 10 days after the bombing, Mark Rosewall was interviewing two CIA agents who told him categorically that the ATF agents were told not to come to work on April 19th because the building was coming down. In another report, because the media was being deluged by phone calls from people saying why weren't the ATF in their offices that day? Lester D. Martz, the special agent in charge of the Dallas Regional Office, made this comment. The facts are that the ATF's employees in Oklahoma City were carrying out their assigned duties as they would any workday, and several of them were injured in the explosion. Then Lester Martz stated this, We were there and we were heroes, he said. The ATF claimed that Alex McCauley, the resident agent in charge, was in an elevator when the bomb went off. He survived a free fall from the 8th to the 3rd floor and escaped by breaking through the thick metal doors and went on to rescue survivors in the stairwell. Some people who lost family members in the blast. One man by the name of Glenn Wilburn contacted the Midwestern Elevator Company, the firm that had actually searched the elevators for survivors. This is what the Midwestern Elevator Company stated to Glenn Wilburn. One of their engineers, I'm quoting, Dwayne James. We found that five of the six elevators were frozen between floors. We had to go in through the ceilings of the elevator to check for people. All were empty. James went on to say that it was impossible for Agent Alex McCauley to have broken out before James's team arrived. Not unless he had a blowtorch with him. The doors were frozen shut. It took several of our men over 12 hours just to get one elevator opened. James concludes... For any of the elevators to have been in a free fall is pure fantasy. Modern elevators have counterbalances and can free fall, can't free fall unless you cut the cables, and no cables were cut. There are a series of backup safety switches that will lock an elevator in place if it increases in speed more than 10%. Obviously, Lester Martz, special agent for the ATF, 
in charge of the Dallas regional office, lied through his teeth. There were no ATF agents in the Murrah building. He simply lied to try to cover up the ATF. In a report I got off the internet from serendipity.magnet.hotmail, it stated this, Others find the whole business to be extremely fishy because of the fact that no ATF or FBI agents were in their offices at the time of the blast. Once again, Mark Boswell, in a shortwave radio broadcast ten days after the bombing, interviewing 28-year CIA veterans James Black and Ron Jackson stated that the ATF agents were not in their offices because they were told the building was coming down. Now this leads us to a question. If the ammonium nitrate diesel fuel bomb, which may not have even and probably wasn't even in the Ryder truck, there were explosives, there's no doubt about that, then Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols are scapegoats, which would lead us to ask ourselves the question, who then bombed the Murrah building? Who would have access to those explosives that would do that kind of damage? Who would have access to the building and the plans of the building, the architectural design of the building, to know exactly where the reinforced structural columns were who could then put those bombs at just those right places? In Mark Boswell's broadcast on the shortwave radio, April 29, in the interview he had with CIA veteran James Black and his assistant Ron Jackson, the men stated that they had in their hands sworn affidavits sworn by two Justice Department officials which stated they were part of a committee of ten who planned the Oklahoma City bombing. The officials claimed the bomb was supposed to go off at 6 a.m. with no one around as a scare tactic to procure sympathy, money, and power for government agencies. But something went wrong and it was detonated later during business hours. These Justice Department officials are in hiding because they're afraid for their lives. I noticed on the internet, on www.periscope.com, they gave a list of 30 questions. They said 30 Oklahoma City bombing questions that demand an answer now. The first one was, why was every badge-carrying federal agent absent from work at 9 o'clock on a weekday morning, their offices staffed only with civilian clerical workers? Why did the ATF fabricate a story about Alex McCauley, make him out to be a hero, 
when that was an absolute lie. Why was United States Judge Wayne Alley, whose office was located in the federal building, warned several weeks in advance in a Justice Department memo to be prepared for an unnamed terrorist act directed against the federal building? A terrorist act against the federal building? The Justice Department told United States Judge Wayne Alley, who made this admission to the Portland Oregonian immediately after the bombing? How did the Justice Department know that there would be a terrorist act against the Murrah building? Unless they themselves had placed bombs at key structural columns inside it. After Judge Wayne Alley made the statement to the Portland Oregonian, he has since refused to repeat it or allow himself to be interviewed again. Why? Why is Judge Alley all of a sudden tongue-tied. We could go on and on. Why did the director of the University of Oklahoma's geological survey, Dr. Charles Mankin, tell the media that according to two different seismographic records, there were two blasts the second approximately eight seconds after the first. Why has the information of Benton K. Parton not come to the light of day? Why? Thirty questions to ask ourselves. Why, why, why? The 29th question stated this. Why was the reaction of the Clinton administration blaming right-wing radio talk shows for the incident and demanding the most draconian police state legislation ever proposed in the United States, so swift and obviously organized. A blizzard of Oklahoma City-inspired domestic terrorism bills were rushed into Congress in a matter of days. These laws cover everything. Laws? There were laws that were in Congress just before the Oklahoma City bombing and right after it they were passed that had to do with setting up a police state in America and taking away some of our most fundamental freedoms that are guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights? To answer some of those questions, let's turn the tape over at this time. There were laws in Congress just prior to the Oklahoma City bombing that were stalling and right after the bombing, they were immediately passed? Yes, there were. Who would be behind the passing of these laws? Who would it be that could think up such a diabolical and dastardly and deadly bombing of the Alfred E. Murrah building in Oklahoma City? Taken from the Orlando Sentinel, 
It's called Terror in the Heartland. Terrorism Bill moves very fast. This was taken from the Orlando Sentinel, April 21st, 1995. We read this. On Tuesday, the Omnibus Counterterrorism Act of 1995 was on a slow track in Congress and the subject of a lively debate as to whether it would violate some fundamental civil liberties, including the right to confront one's accuser. Now, after the Oklahoma City bombing, there are few sure legislative bets in Washington. Democrats and Republicans issued news releases Thursday calling for the bill's quick passage. The Orlando Sentinel right there said that before the bombing in Oklahoma City, there was a counterterrorism act that was on slow track in Congress and it looked like there would be lively debate because this act or this bill would attack certain fundamental liberties we have as Americans. But after the Oklahoma City bombing, all Democrats and Republicans, they were ready to pass it immediately. That's interesting. Ten days after the bombing, April 29th, 1995, the Orlando Sentinel, again, the title, Clinton Urges Swift Action on Anti-Terrorism Legislation. The article reads thus, President Clinton prodded Congress on Friday to move swiftly on his anti-terrorism legislation and avoid political endless quibbling over details. We must not dawdle or delay, Clinton said. Congress must act promptly. His $1.25 billion anti-terrorism package would expand law enforcement's investigative and enforcement powers and toughen penalties for certain crimes. Republicans have reacted favorably to the proposals Clinton put forward on Wednesday, one week after the Oklahoma City bombing. From those two articles in the Orlando Sentinel, I'm getting a particular flavor that the Oklahoma City bombing was pivotal towards the passing of this anti-terrorism bill. That before the bombing, there was question over whether or not it would go through Congress because there were a lot of liberties that could possibly be threatened by this law or this bill. In another internet article called www.worldnewsstand.net written by Pat Shannon, there is a quote made by Richard K. Moore. He says, In my opinion, the goal of the Oklahoma City operation was to pass the anti-terrorism bill without debate. If there had been debate, the issues of constitutional liberties and the creation of a police state would have been raised in public debate. Our rulers prefer that the police state be implemented without the public noticing by creating a climate of national hysteria Using a staged terrorist attack, the bill sailed through with no debate or discussion. Mission accomplished.
what were some of those civil liberties that would be attacked? What were some of the draconian ideas that were outlined in this anti-terrorism bill? From the article on the internet quoted before about the 30 questions that demand an answer, www.periscope.com. It says this, these proposed laws cover everything from banning virtually all privately owned firearms to unlimited and court admissible federal wiretaps, censorship of the internet, suspension of habeas corpus in terrorism cases. These are a direct attack on our fundamental liberties as American citizens. These attack our right to bear arms, our right to have our own weapons. Now, I am a Christian, and I don't have a gun. But somebody is entitled, as a United States citizen, to own a firearm. And this bill attacks and says that privately owned firearms should be banned. Wiretaps should be admissible. Censorship of the internet, suspension of habeas corpus. And then last but not least, was the gross destruction of the First Amendment advocated in Charles Schumer's bill, which was H.R. 2580, which imposes a five-year prison sentence for publicly engaging in unseemly speculation and publishing or transmitting by wire or electronic means baseless conspiracy theories regarding the federal government of the United States. Who decides what is a baseless conspiracy theory? It's the very people that made the anti-terrorism bill. They could accuse Benton Parton, a 31-year veteran of the United States Air Force, an expert in explosives, who said that Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols did not bomb the Oklahoma City building, that it was bombs that were strategically placed on the structural columns. Is Benton Parton? liable for using his expertise to say that it was not done, that the bomb in the Ryder truck could not have done the damage that the government is saying? Could Benton Parton be arrested? Under that bill he could be. Could I be arrested for the information and the evidence that demands an answer on this tape? I could. How was it possible that a normally cumbersome, slow, inefficient legislative branch able to move so quickly, so comprehensively, and so efficiently in introducing laws which would strip Americans of certain basic freedoms. How could this be? May the 1st, 1995, Time Magazine stated this, Americans must decide how much freedom they're willing to trade for more security. How much should they be willing to give up in convenience money and the freedoms they take for granted? 
the issue of Oklahoma City was stripping Americans of basic fundamental freedoms that we have in the United States Constitution. And the question I would like to ask you, who, who would be behind the destruction of the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans? Who, is there a power in the world today that's been around for a long time that from the be very beginning of this nation has despised and detested the liberties that we are guaranteed as Americans? Is there such a power? Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter of August the 15th, 1854, stated this, the absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience. Now, where is liberty of conscience guaranteed? It's guaranteed in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution. And Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter, of August 15th, 1854 states that liberty of conscience is absurd and erroneous and a most pestilential error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. In 1864, in his encyclical letter, Pius IX anathematized those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship. Do you hear what Pope Pius IX is saying? He is saying that anybody who believes that every person is entitled to freedom to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience, he said they should be anathematized. To anathematize somebody is to confine them to hell. To consider them to be a heretic worthy of damnation. In a book entitled The Vatican and the Dollar, written by British broadcasting journalist Avril Manhattan, who has died about eight years ago now, in his book entitled The Vatican and the Dollar on page 26, Manhattan declares the Vatican condemned the Declaration of Independence as wickedness and called the Constitution of the United States a satanic document. You know, I often wondered growing up as a young man why my dad always rooted for the team that played against Santa Clara University. He always rooted for the team that played against Notre Dame or against the University of San Francisco? I believe my dad understood that those Jesuit Catholic schools were training men and women to go out and to oppose the beautiful liberties that we have as United States citizens. From another book called The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, written by Burke McCarty, on pages 9 and 10 of her book, we read these words. The Holy Alliance of Prince Metternich of Austria 
had laid well their plans to destroy popular government in the American colonies. Now anytime you find a holy alliance or the holy Roman Empire, it is because the Catholic Church has its dastardly fingers involved in whatever's taking place. So the Holy Alliance of Prince Metternich of Austria that convened right around 1818. In the book by Burke McCarty, it stated that the Holy Alliance laid well their plans to destroy the popular government of the United States of America. And shortly after that, President James Monroe, in his annual address to Congress, stated that the United States would regard it as an act of hostility to the government of the United States if this coalition of the Holy Alliance or any other power of Europe ever undertook to establish upon the American continent any control of any American republic or to acquire any territorial rights. This was James Monroe's famous Monroe Doctrine. Were you ever told that the Monroe Doctrine was a direct challenge to the Holy Alliance and the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church that if they tried to destroy this republic or to set up any colonies in this American republic that the United States government would consider it an act of hostility? Do you realize that James Monroe was confronting the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church with his famous doctrine? The Holy Alliance was set up to destroy this free government of the United States. Samuel B. Morse in his famous document, yes indeed, this is the man who wrote or who invented the Morse code. In the 1830s, Samuel B. Morse went to Europe and he wrote a book entitled Foreign Conspiracy Against the United States. In the preface to that book, volume 1, page 4, it says this, the author undertakes to show that a conspiracy against the liberties of this republic is now in full action under the direction of Prince Metternich of Austria, who knowing the impossibility of obliterating this troublesome example of a great and free nation by force of arms, is attempting to accomplish his object through the agency of an army of Jesuits. Samuel B. Morse and the man who wrote the preface to his great work, both of these men understood that the Jesuit order and the Holy Alliance were committed to destroying the freedoms of this great republic of the United States of America. Finally, one other document entitled 50 Years in the Church of Rome by a former priest, Charles Chiniqui. He was at a meeting of priests and on page 398 of his marvelous book, he quotes the priests of Rome stating this, We will rule the United States and lay them at the feet of the vicar of Jesus Christ that he may put an end to their godless system of education and impious laws 
of liberty of conscience, which are an insult to God and man. I ask you, the President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, trained at Georgetown University, which is the Jesuit school of the East Coast. William Jefferson Clinton pushing Congress to pass the anti-terrorism bill that would be a direct assault on the liberties that we enjoy as Americans. as a result of the Oklahoma City bombing that was planned and carried out and fully known by the government of the United States and by the President. And the secret players behind the President and the Justice Department and all the federal agencies involved the secret players behind them all who have wanted to destroy the liberties of this great republic for the last 200 plus years was the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church. They have wanted to put an end to the laws that guarantee our liberties as United States citizens. And in order to bring that out, they carried out the greatest terrorist bombing on U.S. soil in U.S. history. In closing today, I want to share just a brief story. This has not just gone on in U.S. soil. Henry IV, King of Navarre, King of France, a Roman Catholic. But Henry of Navarre, after the horrible St. Bartholomew's massacre of the Huguenots of 1572, 26 years later, Henry IV of France granted freedom through the Edict of Nantes. You spell Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S. He granted freedom for the Huguenots to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. He granted them religious freedom in 1598. Twelve years later, as Henry IV came through Paris in a carriage, a man came out of the crowd, jumped up onto the carriage wheels, and in a moment stabbed Henry IV. And in 1610, Henry IV of France was dead. Now countless historians have made it very, very clear that the assassin, his name was Revelic, and Revelic was a Jesuit. If you study down through history, any time somebody has stood for freedom, for liberty for their people, they have come under attack from the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order. I ask you today, do you realize that the liberties that we love as Americans are under subtle, deceptive, and hateful attack by the Church of Rome? 
by the organized leadership of the Roman Catholic Church through the Jesuit order, do you realize they want to destroy the constitution of this great land? Do you realize they are rapidly down the track in fulfilling what the priest said in Chiniqui's book? You and I must stand for those freedoms. You and I must stand for the greatest man of all that ever lived who made it possible for you and me to stand free before God. His name was Jesus. And the angel said to his father, Joseph, you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the great, greatest freedom marcher there ever was. He declared himself, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus longs to free you today, to free you from guilt, to free you from past sin and wrong, to set you free and then to help you to stand in that God-given freedom, to stand for these precious freedoms that we have as American citizens. Attacks will come again. Freedoms will be attacked again. And liberty will be taken away. May we ever be standing on the side of right, on the side of truth, as it is in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you that the truth can set us free. No more questions. Thank you so much. Help us to continue to search and to plant our feet on solid ground. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until we meet again in our next tape on Behind the Door, in which we will look at the life, the work, and the death of the greatest president that ever lived. Until we have that study in Behind the Door, Part 5, on Abe Lincoln. May God bless you.